Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Cushman and Wakefield's latest Capital Markets webinar presentation. My name's Anna Town. I'm based down in Sydney, and I head up the business development services team here at Cushman and Wakefield. So today we're going to review how the Asia Pacific markets performed in the first half of the year, and as you can see, take a deep dive into the Singapore market. And I think this is quite opportune given it was Singapore's national holiday on Monday, and it would be remiss of me not to wish Singapore a very happy 56th birthday on behalf of all of us um, on the call. So while the virus doesn't seem to be done with us yet, um, unfortunately, as you're going to hear over the next 60 minutes, um, we're seeing a continued recovery and growth across capital markets in Asia Pacific. You know, overall volumes are up about 5% year on year, but there is double digit growth in some key markets, including Greater China, Australia, Singapore, India, Vietnam and Indonesia. But I don't want to um, spoil the presentation. Um, we'll come on to that in a second. So if I could introduce our speakers that we have on the webinar for you today. Um, First of all, we've got Catherine Chen, who heads our capital markets research team, and she's going to give us this tour around Asia Pacific, look at where we're seeing the capital markets activity emerge um, and dissect asset class by asset class. And, you know, no surprise again that industrial continues to be the darling asset class of the, the industry, but, um, you know, retail is making a bit of a comeback and, and Catherine will go through that. After Catherine, we have Xian Yang, who's recently been promoted to the head of research in our Singapore business, and he is going to take a deep dive into what's been happening in Singapore. Um, he'll take us through Singapore's um, path to recovery despite the resurgence of, of COVID um, that has happened in Singapore as well as many places, and, and look at which sectors are doing better than others and where some of those um, attractive investment opportunities might lie. After Xian Yang, um, we have a star-studded panel. We have um, Dennis Yeo, Head of Investor Services based in Singapore, Gordon Marsden, who's the Regional Director of Capital Markets, and Sean Poe, who heads up our capital markets business in Singapore and is an Executive Director of Cushman & Wakefield. So they are all ready to answer your questions. Um, as we go through the presentation, please put them into the little chat box with the question mark on the top right hand corner of your screen. And with that, I will hand over to Catherine and hope you enjoy the webinar today. Thank you, Anna. Let's first take a look at the overall market performance in Asia Pacific. As it says on the title, APAC was leading global recovery as being the first to see GDP bouncing back to pre-pandemic level by Q4 last year. This is already half a year ahead of the US and one year ahead of Europe as being forecast by Moody's. Although there appears to be another wave of Delta variant and currently hitting the Asian economies as countries getting better and better at managing the outbreak. And also with increasing vaccination rates, we believe that the war should have already been passed. In addition, Asia Pacific is also the first to see our net absorption bouncing back to positive territory since the third quarter of last year, led by strong occupier demand in China, Japan and South Korea. There are, these are the type of countries where working from home or, or remote working is not encouraged by the local culture. Thus, once the pandemic is contained, these markets tend to see the fastest rebound of office demand. There has been further, uh, this has been further proven by China's latest Q2 office figures showing that the quarterly net absorption has reached a record high in Q2 and a total of over 30 million square feet, uh, square feet of additional office space has been leased within the first half of this year. Looking at the capital market, Asia Pacific was also the first to see positive growth in real estate investment for three quarters in a row. Although the year-on-year -year gro growth rate in Q2 was lower than that in North America and EMEA, now, this is because APAC did not have a large drop in invest volume last year as North America and EMEA did. In other words, investment activity in Asia Pacific has been relatively stable and further growth is, is expected. This slide shows a map of the latest Moody's 
global business cycle status, and we can see Asia Pacific has the largest green area, which means economic expansion. Compared to the previous business cycle in March, where only mainland China, Vietnam, and Taiwan were in expansion, by, Ju by July, we saw many more APEC economies moving towards expansion, including Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, and South Korea. But at the same time, Japan, Vietnam, and other Southeast Asian economies have now been labeled as at, at risk due to the rise of new COVID cases in those countries. While all nations in the world face the risk of, of potential COVID resurgence, those who rely less on international travel and tourism will likely be more resilient. Looking ahead, 20 2021 is expected to be a year of recovery and growth, led by India and mainland China, with GDP growth being forecast to hit 8% this year. Other mature economies such as Hong Kong, Singapore, and Australia are all forecast to see robust GDP growth this year. Looking at a more long-term perspective, growth will likely be led by the Southeast Asian countries such as Philippines, Vietnam, and Indonesia. Now let's Let's take a look at the commercial real estate investment market. Total transaction volume in Asia Pacific was up again by 5% year on year in the first half of 2021. In addition, we saw we saw double digit growth in many markets such as China, including Hong Kong, Taiwan, Australia, Singapore, India, Vietnam, and Indonesia. The largest market, Greater China, recorded a total of over 30 billion US dollar of transaction in H1 and have several large portfolio deals to be closed in the later half of this year. Japan, the host of Olympics 2020, was the most favored market by overseas investors in Asia Pacific last year. Nonetheless, investment activity in Japan dropped this year partly as a result of the fourth state of, fourth state of emergency in Japan and a lack of tradable core assets in the office or retail market. On the other hand, Japan's multifamily sector remains strong and continue to be chased by both in both international and the local capital. Australia benefited by solid economic fundamentals and a high degree of market transparency, continue to see a robust investment this year across office, retail and logistics sectors. South Korea, one of very few markets in the world that saw investment volume edging up in 2020 despite the COVID pandemic, continued to register growth this year at 2%. Seoul's office market has been particularly robust, and as a result, the average CBD office price in Seoul has jumped by more than a third since the start of the COVID outbreak. Singapore, I will leave it to Shen Yang to, to discuss the market details. And the last but not the least, India, the rising economic powerhouse has attracted an increasing number of overseas investors, including Blackstone and Brookfield. Total cross-border transaction in India reached nearly 5 billion US dollar in 2020, and we expect to see further growth in the years ahead. On cross-border transactions, last, last year we saw an increasing representation of investors outside APAC, as indicated by the light blue bar on the first chart. This year, the APEC, in, uh, the APEC investors were gearing up and cross-border capital flow was evenly split between investors within and outside APEC in the first half of this year. Top sources of cross-border cap capital included Hong Kong and Singapore, notably Link Read, ESR, and GIC. As many of you may have read the news, ESR has made an, uh, an agreement to acquire ARA for 5.2 billion US dollar, and together the joint entity will become the largest real, real estate fund manager in Asia Pacific and the third largest in the world behind only Blackstone and Brookfield, the two investors who have been also very aggressive on APAC markets recently, especially in India and China. The COVID pandemic has only made the real estate invest market more competitive with the larger invest managers being able to access more capital and therefore be able to underwrite investment with a longer return perspective. On top targets of cross-border capital, China has once again made to the top place, <clears throat> tracking over 5 billion 
first starter of overseas capital in the first half of this year. We expect China to maintain its top position given the current investment pipeline. In addition, the latest global sovereign asset management study by Invesco also showed that China's popularity has in increased since 2019. According to a survey, sovereign capital around the world continue to highlight that they see the country as an attractive investment destination premised on its impressive economic growth and higher asset return than most Western markets. By property sector, while office remained as a top investor asset class, the transaction volume was down by 12% last year, partly as a result of softening pricing in some markets and also increasing liquidity targeting the industrial properties. Nonetheless, office remain as a hotspot in international gateway cities such as Sydney, Seoul, and Beijing, with the exception in Hong Kong, which is now more driven by industrial investment. Speaking of, in, uh, speaking of industrial assets, it includes a wide range of products covering logistics, data centers, R&D centers, and life science parks all have gained increasing popular, uh, popularity as a result of the COVID pand pandemic. Increasing competition for capital targeting these properties have also continued to place downward pressure on the cap rates. And in some markets, cap, cap rates of prime logistic assets have become even lower than that of retail properties. These, uh, this in turn brought opportunities for experienced retail investors and asset managers to take advantage of more favorable pricing being offered on retail asset at the moment. Looking ahead, the Asia Pacific real estate market will continue to be supported by an uh, by an abundance of global dry powder currently currently in the market. In addition, according to a survey by Hostwell, Asia Pacific investors plan to increase their allocation to real estate by 4.6 percentage points from what they have deployed in 2020 to 12. 0.1% in 2021. This also represents the largest share of allocation to real estate and the highest increase from 2020 compared to EMEA and American investors. In conclusion, we expect the Asia Pacific market to continue to be benefited by the large amount of dry powder as well as pent up demand post pandemic. So, what are there to buy? Under core investment, urban logistics, Gateway city offices and the no-cycle sectors such as rental apartment data centers and essential retail will remain in demand in the years ahead and are also less likely to be impacted by unexpected events like the COVID pandemic. These properties are also anticipated to yield sustainable long-term return driven by, driven by continuous socioeconomic development such as office job growth, e-commerce, and the rise of the income class. On the core plus and value add, in, investors may find a, a variety of opportunities depending on the value add element, which can range from physical asset enhancement or, or upgrading, especially for aging properties in the CBD area, to simply tenant repositioning to improve rental, rental income. And finally, under opportunistic investment, which allows for more creativity and freedom to build a to build a project from scratch, ESG and tech-driven innovation will likely be the key success factors for such development. Moreover, inv investors can keep a look for distressed or underperforming assets via platform investment, as well as opportunities in the growing emerging markets such as India, Vietnam, and in Indonesia. With that, I will now hand over to Shen Yang to take us through the Singapore investment market. Over to you, Shen Yang. Thank you, Catherine. Okay, now I'll be presenting <clears throat> an overview on the Singapore market, where we will cover the residential, office, retail, and the industrial markets. So, but first, let's do a quick recap of what happened in the first half of 2021. First, we saw the emergence of the Delta variant of the coronavirus in Singapore, which saw the government implementing a phase two heightened alert, which was somewhat like a watered down lockdown. Measures included a dine-in ban, uh, work from home was made a default, and social gathering groups was reduced to two packs, which made, I mean, viewings quite challenging for, for the real estate professionals. But despite this, GDP growth continued to grow, 
and jumped by 15% year on year in the second quarter of 2021. Also, unemployment have continued to decline for eight for the eight consecutive months to reach about 2.7%. So both of both of these factors point to a strong recovery for the Singapore economy despite you know the pandemic. But nonetheless, what we are seeing is a K-shaped recovery with sectors such as manufacturing, finance, and tech seeing healthy expansions, while many sectors such as uh, real estate services, accommodation and retail still remain below pre-pandemic levels. But in all, Singapore is poised to exceed 6% GDP growth and return to pre-COVID levels. Singapore has one of the highest vaccination rates in Asia. I think currently it's about 70% of the population have been fully vaccinated as of today. And also we have a very strong track record in containing the pandemic and this is a really strong differentiating factor in the region, and we are expected to be a front runner for post pandemic recovery. Uh, next. So with strong economic recovery expected this year, investor demand has come back strongly as the outlook has become clearer and more promising. Total investment volumes in the first half of this year reached about 11 billion, and this was driven mainly by the residential segment, taking up about 44% of first half sales. With strong demand for luxury residential properties like uh, good class bungalows, and we have also seen developers bidding aggressively for development sites in the mid-tier and mass market area. And given the way the pandemic has shaped our way of living, we just, we've just seen strong investor demand for, in, for industrial in the industrial market. Total industrial transactions in the first half of this year has already surpassed what we have seen in 2020 by over 50%. Investor interest was especially high for city fringe business parks, like, uh, like with Blackstone's uh, acquisition of the sand, sand crawler, which is located at one north, uh, which is a city fringe business park, which caters to the life science and tech and media industries. So within the commercial market, Right, which, uh, which you can see in the dark blue lines, which includes both office and retail segments. Investors have continued to put money in offices despite higher levels of remote working, signifying their confidence in the long-term outlook of the office market. Investment was especially healthy in the strata market, market where Suntech REIT sold a portfolio of strata offices at Suntech City to Silk Road Fund for, for nearly 200 million. Also, you also saw record highs being achieved in the strata office building, uh, namely Samsung Hub, where a floor was sold for 4,050 per square foot. While hospitality de uh, deals remain largely absent, there have been small pockets of activities, and we expect more deals to come into the market as the outlook on leisure travel becomes clearer uh, from 2022. So, Moving forward, investment volumes are poised to recover to pre-pandemic levels as market liquidity remains flush and investors are looking to deploy their capital before prices start to run away. Next, okay. So for the residential market, uh, let's dig a little bit deeper right, into the residential market, which grew the most, which drew the most investments in the first half of this year. So like many cities worldwide, the Singapore private residential market is experiencing a boom with very strong demand coupled with new limited supply due to construction delays, and this has pushed prices to record levels. Prices have increased by 4% year to date in the first half of 2021, and transaction volumes for this half, for the first half of 2021, are really approaching the whole of 2020 levels. So while the bulk of transactions are driven by local demand, we have seen rising levels of foreign buyers as well, and this has propped up prices within the high-end market segment, and even at Sentosa, which is the only place in Singapore where foreigners can easily acquire landed properties. So in a world where there's a high levels of uncertainty, Singapore's status as a hub of stability has attracted many high net worth individuals to purchase residential property in Singapore. And with new completions being delayed, due to the pandemic and also current labor constraints. Upcoming supply till 2023 is expected to remain tight and this bottleneck on supply may push prices higher. And with such strong sales, 
developers' unsold inventory has also come down to four year low. And this is fueling a developer's acquisition for land. Next. So moving to industrial. So while manufacturing has, one, has been one of the key drivers of economic growth since 2020, even within the manufacturing economy, the growth is remains K-shaped. So what I mean by that is uh, sectors such as biomedical electronics are growing strongly due to increased demand due to life science, to higher demand for life science, and also the semiconductor boom. But other sectors such as general manufacturing, uh, marine and aerospace transportation, and the construction sector remain below pre-pandemic levels. So this, the, the disparity in, in, in the manufacturing economy has impacted impacted the industrial real estate market, which caters to different industrial sectors. So for example, city fringe business parks, which caters a lot to the biomedical, media and tech sectors, have seen healthy growth in rents. And we've seen rents in the second quarter of this year increasing by 2.3% quarter and quarter. And we're also seeing a flight to quality as these occupiers prefer newer and better spec business parks, which are predominantly located at the city fringe. And we also seen these city fringe business parks have also benefited from the decentralization of some occupiers out of the CBD, and they have taken up space at city fringe business parks. But on the other hand, outlying business parks, which tend to have older stock, have not really benefited from the decentralization of CBD tenants, and rents have fallen in the latest quarter by about 0.5% Q on Q. And within the factory space, high tech spaces, high tech spaces have also outperformed with rents rising slightly in the second quarter of 2021, while rent, while conventional factory rents have remained flat. And not surprising with the boom in e-commerce, prime logistics have also performed well with rents growing about 2.2% quarter on quarter in 2Q 2021. So moving forward, uh, rents for conventional factory space may see limited growth as we'll see quite a lot of supply coming to the market over the next one and a half years. So site selection will be really important for this segment. For warehouses and business, park, business parks, uh, supply remains limited until about 2023, and we still see steady rent, rental growth for these segments. Okay, next. So moving to the office market, CBD grade A rents turned positive in uh, second quarter 2021, growing about 0.5% Q and Q. This comes after five consecutive quarters of decline. The increase in rents was driven by a flight to quality, and we saw rents increases, especially for the prime office buildings within the CBD. So while there have been sectors such as the banking sector that has been giving up space, these have been backfilled by tech and investment companies which have been expanding aggressively in Singapore. And also office using employment grew by 5,800 in the first quarter of 2021. And this, is, this has surpassed the whole of 2020 levels. However, overall net demand remains relatively weak. And while rents have turned positive, vacancy rates have still continued to rise as new net supply have outpaced net demand. So while there are signs of recovery, it still remains on shaky grounds. But nonetheless, we still expect positive rent growth for the whole of 2021 in view of the recovering economy and the ongoing vaccination drive, which will allow more people to return to the office. Next. So last but not least, looking at the retail market, while retail sales have been recovering since last year, it still remains below pre-pandemic levels. And while the adoption of online sales has accelerated to about 11% of total retail sales uh, compared to 6% pre-pandemic, it still remains a small proportion of overall retail consumption. So you can see most consumers still prefer to purchase at brick and mortar stores. But nonetheless, given current travel restrictions and safe management measures, footfalls at malls have fallen and prime retail rents have been on decline since last year. So the Orchard and other city areas, which includes the CBD, rents in these markets continue to be pressured 
as the most due to lower food force as um, office workers continue to work from home. On the other hand, suburban malls have benefited from the work from home trend and were the most resilient in terms given their proximity to residential catchments. So while we could see retail rents continue to decline for the rest of 2021, the decline is expected to be mild as occupancy of prime retail space remains high. And we could see recovery in the retail market next year and this could mean returning interest, especially for experiential retail malls that are able to merge the online and offline experience. Next. So this is a chart for the rental cycle for the various office and industrial markets uh, in Southeast Asia. So in the top half of the chart, the green area is an indication of an outlook of rising rents, which signifies that conditions are favorable for the landlord. And while the bottom half, the red area, is an indication of falling rents, and uh, these means that conditions are tenant favorable. So not surprising, most industrial markets are on the upward rent cycle, given the rise of e-commerce and also strong interest in logistics and data center assets. On the other hand, most office markets remain tenant favorable as rents continue to weaken. Only Singapore and Vietnam are looking at a positive rental outlook for both industrial and office markets as of the second quarter of 2021. Now, similar to Singapore, which is experiencing a flight to quality and also seeing limited new supply, Vietnam office rents are supported due to limited new grade A supply in both Ho Chi Minh City and Hanoi. Okay, next. So finally, this is the concluding slide. And here we highlight some investment opportunities in Singapore. For offices, we see demand for good quality office assets as tenants embark on a flight to quality. The offices which have innovative green features and technologies will be highly sought after given the current focus on sustainability. So office cap rates for CBD grade A offices are currently at about 3.2% and with recovering rents and flush liquidity in the region, we expect further cap rate compression and capital values to increase over the next few years. And given the ongoing flight to quality, we see opportunity in value add strategies for asset enhancement in older CBD buildings and also for strata title sale. And given the demand for bite-sized commercial investments, CBD in conservation shop houses, which are underpinned by limited stock, would benefit from returning office workers in the CBD are also opportunities for consideration. For industrial, Given the rise in e-commerce and also for food deliveries, we see continued demand for logistics properties and food factories and also uh, cold, storage for, cold storage facilities, though available market stock remains fairly limited. City fringe business parks, which are supported by strong talent pools such as tech, media and bio, life, science, life science, will be highly sought after for their stable income streams. Data centers are in high demand due to increasing digitalization and, and current limited supply in Singapore due to the moratorium. For retail, while operating conditions remain challenging over the short term, retail malls that can deliver a good consumer experience and are able to merge the online and offline experience seamlessly will be in demand. So malls that have been designed with deliveries in mind where the delivery drivers can easily pick up the goods will be in good demand. Suburban malls especially will be highly relevant given an increase in remote working. And also retail spaces in Orchard, in Orchard will also be one to watch as many major and international new to market brands still look towards Orchard to start their expansion in Singapore. For the residential market, we see growth in the luxury market as more wealth flows into Singapore. Many family offices are setting up shop in Singapore and the rise of the nouveau rich from the tech boom is driving this segment, snapping up luxury homes and landed properties. And given the strong growth in residential prices, there's also opportunity for office developments, which are eligible for the CBD incentive scheme, which will allow them to be converted into mixed developments. Right. So given the health, given a strong underlying local demand and their strong preference for properties near to amenities, Potential developments near to MRT stations and major decentralized commercial nodes such as One North would be highly sought after. So in sum, 
in a world with lots of uh, uncertainty, the keyword is stability, and Singapore really provides a lot of that. And we are expected to, you know, to come out of this pandemic really strong. And we are already seeing signs of recovery in most real estate segments. And investors, which are armed with lots of liquidity, are really looking to enter the market. So this concludes the end of the presentation for Singapore, and I hope it has been insightful for everyone. Thank you. So maybe uh, I will move on to the next segment, uh, which is the panel discussion. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, Shane, uh, for sharing your thoughts on Singapore investment market. And now it's our Q&A panel discussion time. And please feel free to ask us your most burning questions. I already saw some questions coming up during the presentation, and there seems to be a lot of interest on ESR's acquisition of ARA. Um, and I will start the question with Dennis. What's your view on this transaction? Do you see this as an emerging trend in the APAC investor community to drive growth in the new economy sectors? Dennis, you are on mute. <laughs> Just unmute yourself. Okay, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. the new economy, economy assets are really the logistics and data centers. You know, um, as everyone knows, they are harder and harder to expand, you know, as a result of too much capital going after very limited quality assets. And here we talk about quality assets, right? We no longer talk about a uh, tin sheet sheds, you know, but we really talk about good quality warehouses. So they're, they're very limited in supply. And even if they were, they would supply, they were in the last few years been taken up um, by, by existing players and large players, right? So there is this trend towards development and development in potential markets may not be your first year market right now, but developments in countries where there are huge population, um, where there are potential to grow uh, this e-commerce uh, 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 market, right? So ARA in the last year, uh, last two years, actually acquired Logos, right? And Logos um, is, big in development of modern warehouses, logistic assets in Southeast Asia country, including Indonesia and more lately, uh, Vietnam. So this fit into the trend of the logistic, you know, capital markets going forward, right? I mentioned earlier that, you know, we're going for quality assets um, and we have to go into markets where there are huge population base, where there's huge potential for growth in, in the e-commerce, right? Um, but because it is inadequate in supply of good stock, that's why, you know, uh, Logos make a decision some years ago to literally go into Vietnam, uh, go into Indonesia uh, to, to, to redevelop, right? To develop a new stock of uh, uh, quality warehouses. So the other thing is about this coming together, I would say the, the acquisition uh, by ESR, is really, if you look at the profile of ARA's uh, capital source, it's quite different from ESR in that, you know, um, ARA has a relatively high percentage of uh, perpetual and core capital, right? And this is important because, you know, the capital is perpetual. You don't have to keep recycling it and returning back the money to your, to your investors, which means that you you can almost use the the the, the capital to match with your development uh, strategy, right? And 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 like I mentioned earlier, now is the time where you literally have to develop good quality uh, logistic assets to meet the demand of of of, of today, right? Uh, this this happening not only in Indonesia, it is also happening in India, as we can see. Right. The other factor is, of course, increasing their base of users. I mean, all these operators, I mean, all these investors really thrive on servicing their customers, their clients, and you, and you begin to see uh, regional, uh, global clients, uh, global customers, global tenants and occupiers, you know, wanting and demanding um, good quality logistic assets, right? So. So this is the other factor, right? By coming together, you literally enlarge your customer base, your, your tenants base, tenant base. And in addition to that, I would mention uh, China plus one strategy, you know, where companies, uh, manufacturing companies in this sense, 
are looking at a China plus one uh, uh, location, you know, and that could be Vietnam, it could be Indonesia, it could be Thailand and all that. And and yes, you know, uh, the coming together of um, yes, uh, uh, with uh, ARA literally allows for that. And it's a and, and yes, I would say it's a growing trend, you know, in the pursuit of growth. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, Gordon, is there anything to add from your perspective as you're Hong Kong based? Usually. <laughs> <laughs> Usually. Not, not so much um, because I'm Hong Kong based, um, but I just think this is hugely exciting from a global perspective. I mean, you mentioned it when you were talking earlier, Catherine, that um, the combination of these two groups is now the third largest uh, globally, only behind um, uh, sort of Blackstone and, and Brookfield, I believe it is. Um, and, you know, it is truly, I guess, an Asian business. Um, if you think about uh, the origins of uh, ESR and indeed sort of ARA um, you know and you also think about some of their recent um, acquisitions and sort of collaborations you know prior to this um, merger um, you've got something that is truly representative of sort of Asia Pacific so the the E of uh, ESR um, origins in China uh, are the Redwood, you know, Japan origins, Kennedy's as well, uh, Logos, which Dennis mentioned, um, sort of uh, originating out of sort of Australia. And then, of course, the ARA with your very strong sort of Hong Kong, Singapore sort of connections. So I think this is hugely important in terms of positioning real estate in a, in a multi-asset sort of portfolio uh, sort of globally. Um, you know, referring also to an earlier slide, uh, you talked about the under allocation to um, Asian real estate, um, you know, relative to other uh, locations um, and regions around the world. And, um, you know, again, you know, asset allocators, you know, it's all supporting this broader uh, sort of Asian uh, sort of story. So I think that that's a, a hugely important sort of uh, part of this. Um, and, and, you know, both organisations, um, ESR and ARA, have also been, um, you know, increasingly and well supported by um, Asian sources of capital. So Asian pension funds, insurance groups, rising amount of sort of sovereign wealth funds, sort of capital. And, um, you know, and in some respects, great if that can align with, an, you know, an Asian group uh, for deployment uh, sort of globally. You know, we know that um, ARA have now pushed out beyond sort of Asia Pacific and increasingly in the last year or two have started to participate, for example, into sort of European markets. So, you know, maybe we begin to sort of see, you know, the, the Asian capital deploying with an Asian, uh, you know, entity or manager, you know, through into international markets. Uh, and before long, you know, you really have got an organisation that is as diverse and as dynamic as you know the Brookfields uh, and the Blackstones uh, of this world. That's everything from me, Catherine. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, we have another question on Capital's recent offer to privatize Singapore's press holdings non media business. Dennis, do you see this type of entity or platform um, type of position becoming a common vehicle for investors to get access of real estate assets? Dennis, you're on mute again. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, I would say that again, you know, really in the in, in the pursuit of, of, of growth um, by developers and, and funds alike, you know, um, if you know Capo, Capo has done really well, right, in, in data centers globally, right? They, they're probably number one in our region and as well as in offices in Singapore, very good quality assets, right? But if you then look at other asset class and and and, and in globally and in key cities, they require to leapfrog, you know, amongst the many competing platforms and, and, and fund managers, right, in a sense. So the acquisition of um, SPH property business literally will complement the uh, capital strategy of growth, right? Um, the, this acquisition, you know, um, you know, will add on to AUM, okay, uh, add on to their fees, 
you know, and then with this enlarged platform, it will attract more capital, different type of capital as well, you know, and this this will improve their competitiveness in in fund management, right? And as and further, you know, as investment manager, you know, capital can literally cut and dice, you know, their assets as well as uh, SPH assets, you know, to better align both the reads, right? The capital reads as well as the SPH reads. Of course, this is subject to uh, the respective shareholders, uh, unit holders uh, approval, but there is that potential to do that, you know, and if you don't cut and dice, you put them together, right? I mean, you have seen um, what Capital Land has done uh, earlier, you know, uh, merging both their, their commercial um, and as well as their, their, their commercial as well as the retail assets. Right. Um, and so in, in addition, if you then look at SPH uh, student accommodation, senior housing uh, portfolio, and these have been invested over the last few many years, right? And to, to, to now go into that market is probably already very, very tight. Um, you probably have to pay a really ridiculous uh, 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 cap rate to just to get in, you know, and there's a lot more potential in this two uh, leaving market, right? The student accommodation and the senior housing uh, are going forward, right? So, uh, I, I think it's it's a great it's a great strategy that uh, Keppel have put up. You know, it's it's coming together of uh, two very formidable uh, 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 real estate fund managers, and um, I think we we'll, we look forward to them uh, growing um, with a much bigger platform. Thank you, Dennis. Um, I see someone also asked about the Singapore REITs market as there were a lot of consolidations and mergers last year, partly as a response uh, to COVID. Gordon, do you think this sends a positive message to the real estate investment community? Um, yes, in a nutshell, for kind of reasons mentioned earlier. Um, it's around, you know, headlines. Um, you know, increasing the the scale in some respects, and also the you know the flexibility of these groups. So we've seen mergers such as the Capital Land example just mentioned by Dennis. We've also seen um, you know the rebranding, the renaming, which has created um, you know greater geographical flexibility um, for sort of other REITs. So. Um, and all of this activity, hopefully, um, you know, sort of creates increased um, price transparency um, sort of in, in the marketplace. Um, some people would disagree that that was a good thing. Um, but I think that as, you know, investors look to uh, participate into, you know, global real estate and Asia Pacific real estate, then that sort of transparency is an is a important sort of aspect kind of you know sort of felt that okay you know that's all been done we've seen the sort of the clean cleaning up in some respects of some of the larger platforms in Singapore you know what's next and then of course we sort of see you know ESR and uh, an ARA we see you know further privatizations as Dennis has just sort of been talking about and you know that is sort of obviously reflective of just that dry powder that you were talking about at sort of earlier on um, I'm anticipating that that was dry powder in sort of the sense of sort of equity. We're obviously also sort of seeing the ability of groups to be able to raise uh, sort of debt in various forms. So, you know, again, sort of, you know, activity by sort of, you know, sort of Singaporean REITs. We saw sort of Lend Lease increase its stake in the gem at Jurong East um, sort of only a, a few weeks ago. And um, yeah, so there's a there's a buzz, um, which is all uh, sort of very encouraging for uh, for the sector. Thank you, Gordon. Um, I see another question on the impact of the recent resurgence of COVID on Singapore's real estate investment market. Uh, Sean, how are things like na uh, in Singapore now? Does the recent wave of COVID put in investors on hold? Uh, yeah. Catherine, the, the resurgence indeed caught us by surprise, uh, especially when we had just uh, revert uh, to uh, a tighter measure just a couple of weeks after the previous uh, transaction was relaxed. Uh, but this is not unexpected as the, there were already third or fourth wave happening around the region and the Singapore government has also been warning about possible resurgence regularly. So as of today, uh, 
the, the number of COVID cases has come down significantly uh, since mid-July and things are now under control. Also, starting from yesterday, in fact, uh, good news for us, some restrictions have been lifted on uh, dining in and social gathering, which are good news to retailers, especially the F&B operators. I think the impact of uh, tighter measure due to the recent resurgence of uh, the COVID-19 are not as great compared to an early uh, lockdown or circuit breaker that we experienced last year, since this round has only lasted for about two weeks. But however, um, domestic retail, F&B, entertainment, gym, and businesses that uh, with group activities will continue to take the brunt of uh, restriction on social gathering. I think more retailers may bow out uh, due to weakening sales, uh, and this will in turn affect occupancy and revenue for landlords and investors. Uh, nevertheless, helps are available. In fact, Singapore government has set aside more than two billion to support workers and businesses affected by the pandemic. Uh, in fact, just a couple of just last week, the latest being the uh, rental support scheme, which the government has announced, uh, where the government will provide a two-week rental support to commercial tenants and uh, that will be matched by equal amount from private landlords. So even with these challenges, uh, well, uh, as Sen Yang has mentioned, Singapore remain on track to achieve a growth of 4 to 6% this year. So yes, despite the recent setback, we don't see investors slowing down in their search for a good opportunity in Singapore. Uh, Catherine? Thank you, Shyam. Um, a follow-up question for you. Let's say if COVID and travel bans continue for another year, what will be the potential? Potential impact on the Singapore real estate market? Oh, I hope not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, well, um, uh, if travel bans continue for another year, um, I guess tourism and the aviation industry will continue to face headwinds. That means retail sectors and business that are dependent on tourists and business travelers will remain very challenging. Um, However, I think the downward pressure will be countered by recovering and thriving industries such as Infocom, technology, manufacturing, finance, etc., some of which uh, Sen Yang has mentioned in his earlier presentation. Uh, and these are the sectors that investors are keeping their eyes on for opportunities. Um, you, you know, I mean, everybody knows the Singapore government has been managing the COVID-19 pandemic uh, pretty well. So as of today, uh, close to 80%, I just checked my handphone with uh, uh, SMS, close to 80% of the population has received at least one shot of the uh, vaccine. And about 72% of our population are now fully vaccinated. So we are very close to a herd immunity in situation. So this will also become a uh, trump card when we negotiate travel bubbles or travel corridor, you name it, arrangement with other countries for quarantine-free travel. And, and I think many investors that we have spoken to like that, uh, and they will continue to look towards Singapore for opportunities to uh, deploy funds. So, but having said that, uh, there will be some challenges for foreign investors uh, who do not have a team on the ground uh, if travel bans continue for a while more, because physical site inspection of assets and due diligence may be difficult or impossible to carry out. Uh, I guess this is where the consultants like us can play an important role. Uh, for, for some of the reasons to use, in fact, uh, besides providing detailed information pack as detailed as possible, we, we actually organize a virtual tour or site inspection via video conferencing software for overseas investors. We, we recommend that reliable duty consultant advise them. In fact, for some cases, what we did was we introduced reputable, like-minded joint venture local partners to the foreign foreign investor to mitigate the risk. Yeah. So in conclusion, uh, negative impact of prolonged travel bans is apparent, uh, but there is definitely silver lining as I believe uh, border closure will be short term. That's why Singapore government are very confident in the, the growth story for this year, uh, between four to six percent. Although I must say this journey to recovery will be a bumpy one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Captain. Thank you, Sean, for your sharing. Um, I see another question on Hong Kong versus Singapore as an as an investment destination to global investors. Gordon, what's your thought on this? Do you, what do you think will be the key driving factors for investment in Hong Kong in the future compared to Singapore? Uh, 
Thank you, Catherine. This might provoke some um, controversy. Um, Chen Yang, when sort of talking about sort of Singapore, um, sort of spoke about the sort of the stability of Singapore and the resilience of it. Um, and the audience will have sort of seen that in many of the charts where, you know, frankly, the peak to trough on rents uh, has not been that significant. I think that um, as I sort of think about um, this in a Hong Kong sort of context, I think we've seen much more significant uh, peak uh, to trough uh, in terms of rentals, whether or not we're talking about you know, the pressures on you know, CBD offices or the general pressures on uh, you know, the retail sector with the absence of uh, in particular um, mainland Chinese uh, sort of visitors, but obviously international sort of tourism as well. Um, you know, so I would sort of say um, rather than stability, a little bit more dynamism. Is that the right word for sort of describing what the opportunity might be in Hong Kong um, over the coming sort of months? Um, otherwise, sort of, you know, lots of parallels similar to Singapore see sort of falling unemployment and that bounced back on GDP. So I think the figure for Hong Kong for this year was expected to be sort of 7% and then, um, you know, a nice average, you know, 2% for the next decade. Of course, that's not going to come uh, through in that way. We'll see sort of further ups and downs. Um, but, you know, I think what um, is quite clearly underlying sort of Hong Kong at the moment is um, the finance sort of activity, so the the IPO activity, Hong Kong as a um, location for raising uh, sort of finance, um, including new forms of green finance and so forth. And yeah, you know that is kind of helping the banking industry, but there's also a whole professional services sector um, that kind of um, you know feeds off that. Um, for those that are particularly kind of eagle eyed, um, you know, earlier in uh, the presentation deck, we we changed um, uh, a investment strategy from um, late cycle offices to sort of gateway cities. Um, and I think that, um, you know, that perhaps allows uh, the inclusion of Hong Kong um as well you know as we sort of emerge from covid there will be this sort of focus towards you know key gateway sort of cities um so even though you know hong kong in the office sector has got some looming supply you know you've also got the opportunity for investors to to sort of take advantage of uh, this expected sort of growth link to you know mainland china um, activity and to the sort of the finance sector and um, so Again, picking up Shen Yang um, sort of mentioned investment volumes in Singapore are coming back strongly. I think that message is also very applicable uh, to the Hong Kong market as well. That's all from me, Catherine. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, back to Singapore, I see another question on family owned businesses in Singapore. Dennis, do you see that the Singapore family business is being impacted by COVID in any way, um, especially on their investment plans? Well, I think first let's start with you don't know that there are many family owned businesses or even family offices they have set up in Singapore, right? Um, the, the, the positive factors about setting up in Singapore actually include our monetary finance, our tax structures and the gov governance, right? And in addition to that, we have legal and IP infrastructure that protects the investors, right? Um, which is the reason why Singapore is now becoming a, a hub uh, for, for, for real estate investments. And of course, you know, Singapore prior to the pandemic, you know, has been a great way to fly, you know, literally, right? Our airport is not too far away from any part of Singapore. We, our, our airports, you know, covers most of the routes globally, but, but with the pandemic, there are obviously some disruption, you know, which I would say, you know, could very much be mitigated, especially when, the focus of these family offices, family businesses are major matured gateway cities, right? Tokyo, Seoul, you know, Melbourne, uh, Sydney, you know, London, you know, 
these cities are uh, the important thing is that these cities have property laws, processes, protocols to protect the interests of the investors. You know, as as well as uh, very importantly, as Sean had mentioned earlier, you know, professional property services uh, people, you know, that will act for the interests of the investors. Right. So so really, you know, even if you have no boots on the ground, being you're relatively small compared to the major funds, you know, you can still acquire, you know, as and, and in any case, the focus of most of this family office will be on major mature cities. Right. So this is one thing that the pandemic has kind of a uh, you know, uh, move towards, right? Of course, the market to move towards major uh, uh, gateway cities, right? So, for example, you know, some venture actually bought two London assets, you know, without having boots on the ground, you know, um, in that sense. Yeah. Thank you, Dennis. For time reason, I'm going to pick one last question on investment opportunities in Singapore. Um, as many sectors are mentioned in today's presentation, Sean and Dennis, as you are both based in Singapore, what are your suggestions to investors at what they should be looking at the moment? <laughs> Sean, I okay. you go first before I start okay. to talk about Hong Kong and China. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I, we like hospitality and retail, uh, as, as there are likely to be some, I think there are likely to be some short term repricing opportunities. Uh, in, in these asset classes uh, in view of the current situation. Um, for hospitality, uh, maybe you should look out for small to medium scale hotels that are not managed by the international brands. Uh, I think the owners usually are the hotel operator. Uh, these are potentially more, these owners are potentially more motivated to liquidate the assets to recycle capital. Uh, as for retail opportunities, keep an eye on those in the central locations as they are more tourist-centric, therefore a bit more vulnerable. Uh, we also shouldn't ignore suburban malls, with, uh, which uh, Tian Yang has mentioned earlier, as they are relatively defensive and less risky investment uh, due to its proximity to the residential catchments and uh, its tenants mix. However, the ma this market is pretty tight for suburban malls um, as the bigger suburban malls are typically owned by bigger players and they have deep pockets. Yeah. Uh, back to you, uh, Dennis. Well, I think, uh, Sean, you probably have covered the, the sexy part of the, <laughs> <laughs> of the market. You know, true. That, that, true. Yeah, that leaves me to talk about, you know, maybe, um, you know, some life sciences, industrial, some specialized yeah, yeah. Uh, assets, you know, within the invest industrial class, you yeah. know, and in, in, in particular, I would like, I, I like, um, especially when you're not talking about huge funds and huge capital right, investment. Yeah. Um, you, I like shop houses. I like, um, uh, a strata office, you know, potentially there will be a change, a shift in how we use offices, how we use uh, business premises, how we bring people together to a to an office, more to collaborate, and 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 with that change, um, you know, it, it continues to build demands in 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 the market, right? And and you and you have to own it, uh, you 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 have to change it, you know, in order to configure for the future economy. Yep, great. Thank you, thank you, Dennis, Strong, and Gordon for your insights today. And with that, I'll hand over back to Anna for final closing. Back to you, Anna. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, everybody, for that really insightful review of Asia Pacific and and Singapore in particular. I think, you know, we heard from Catherine that volumes are, are definitely recovering, and we expect that to increase across the balance of 21. Um, Gordon pointed out that, you know, that 4.6 um, percentage increase to real estate um, capital allocation um, being the intention of many investors um, into Asia Pacific is, is there waiting for us, um, not only equity, but um, potentially also um, in terms of debt raisings. Um, Catherine kind of went through where we're seeing um, opportunities, be it core in gateway offices, urban logistics, the central retail, and of course, data centers, you know, core plus and value add, some of the tech cities, Beijing, Tokyo, Seoul, Singapore, and some of the Indian cities, to name a few. And then 
of course, the opportunistic plays, Sean just touched on that then, you know, particularly for Singapore around hospitality and um, potentially some retail repricing there and, and of course, emerging markets. I think for me, the key um, takeaway for Singapore um, from Sien Yang and, and others on the webinar was the word stability. Um, Sean gave us that up to the minute um, update on vaccination rates at 72%. You heard it here, hot off the press. And yep, yep. I wish for nothing more, Sean, than a travel bubble between Australia and Singapore as I sit here in lockdown. Um, but I think, you know, you make a point that, you know, Singapore could play that role perhaps as a haven um, for investors coming into the region. And, you know, we see continued investment um, interest in that market. Dennis likes shop houses and strata offices um, in particular. So um, I think, you know, a, a really interesting session, um, you know, thanks to all our speakers. Um, Gordon also um, I perhaps preempted some upcoming content with his description of the opportunity around Hong Kong as being dynamic, perhaps compared to stable in Singapore. So maybe we'll We'll hold you to some more um, content and insights on, on Hong Kong, but we do have plans to give you some deeper insights on Beijing um, as a market in the next sort of eight weeks or so. So please keep an eye out for that session. As per usual, we will send out um, the slide deck and the recording um, if you'd like to listen to it again or share it with some colleagues. But for me, a huge thank you to Catherine, to Dennis, to Sean, Gordon and Sien Yang for their insights today. Thank you everybody for dialing in and stay safe and have a good rest of the week. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Bye everyone.